The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to lecture number seven. In this lecture, I would like to present to you the formulation of structural elements. We will be discussing beam, plate, and shell elements. And I would like to introduce to you the isoparametric approach for interpolations. There are two approaches in the formulation that we can follow. The first one is a strength of materials approach, in which case we look at a straight beam element, we use a beam theory including shear effects. If we look at a plate element, we use a plate theory including shear effects also. The names associated with these series that we're using are the names of Reisner and Mintlin. As a second approach, we have the continuum mechanics approach in which we use the general principle of virtual displacements, but we exclude the stress components not applicable. For example, in a plate, we set the stress through the thickness of the plate equal to zero. In addition, also, we have to impose in the use of the principle of virtual displacements, the kinematic constraints for particles on sections originally normal to the mid-surface. Namely, we have to put the constraint into the structure that the particles remain on a straight line during deformation. Well, as examples I've plotted here, I've shown here two uh, structures, a beam and a shell. Let's look first at a beam. In this case, we have that the original particles normal to the mid-surface or the neutral axis of the beam are on this orange line. I've shown here a large number of particles. The kinematic constraint that we're talking about is that during deformations, these particles remain on a straight line. They move over to the yellow line here. In other words, point A goes to point A prime. Another particle here goes over to this particle here. This particle goes over to that particle, and so on. And these particles remain on a straight line. That is the basic kinematic assumption. However, we should also notice that there is a right angle between the mid-surface or neutral axis of the beam and this line of particles initially. This, is, this right angle is not preserved during deformation. In other words, this angle here is not a right angle. Uh, after deformations anymore. In the case of the shell, the kinematic constraint is quite similar. Here we have now the mid-surface of the shell, shown as a dashed line. The particles on a line normal to that mid-surface are shown here again uh, in orange. This is the initial line. And during deformation, these particles remain on a straight line. Now they have come uh, to be the yellow line here. And we notice that, again, there's a right angle initially here, but that right angle is not preserved during deformations because in each case we are including shear effects. Here we include shear effects, and similarly here we also include shear effects. Well, I've prepared some view graphs uh, to show these facts uh, a, little more, a little bit more distinct. Here we have a first view graph on which I show the assumptions of the basic uh, Bernoulli-Euler beam theory that is used in the development of conventional beam elements. We have here the original beam element with its neutral axis in a dashed line. And that beam element during deformation becomes this, uh, it goes into this uh, shape here. We notice, and this is important, that a section, this section here, which I now mark in blue, goes over into that section, and that the displacement is W at the mid-surface, and that the slope here at right angles to that section is nothing else than dW dx. In other words, this angle here is really nothing else than that angle 
dw dx. This is the Bernoulli Euler beam theory excluding shear deformations. The important point is that when we use this beam theory, we have to match between two elements, w, in other words, the displacement at the mid-surface has to be the same for element 1 and element 2. And in addition, the slope has to be the same for both elements. dw dx for element 1 or on the left-hand side must be equal to dw dx on the right-hand side. This is the conventional beam theory that is used to develop the Hermitian beam elements. Uh, and what I like to introduce to you now is the beam theory that we're using in the isoparametric formulation, uh, namely in the development of modern beam elements, pipe elements, shell elements, and plate elements. I should say at this point that the conventional Hermitian beam element that you are probably familiar with is more effective in engineering analysis than the beam element that I'm talking about here when we just look at a straight beam. However, I want to look at the straight beam here as an example to introduce to you the formulation of the structural elements that I'm talking about. Uh, the formulation is very well displayed, very well demonstrated. The basic features are very well demonstrated looking at the beam element. Also, the application of this formulation to a straight beam element is not as effective as just the usage of a Hermitian beam element. Uh, however, if we talk about curved beam elements, pipe elements, then this formulation is indeed uh, very effective. And of course, for plates and shells, it is really very effective. Let me show to you then the basic points, the basic uh, important points that are being used in the uh, formulation. Here we have, again, our original beam element. The neutral axis is shown here. And this beam element now moves over into this piece, uh, into that shape during deformations. We have a section here. And as I pointed out earlier, that section has to remain straight during deformations. In fact, it moves, it moves right to that section here. Now notice that what we're talking about is a slope dw dx here, which is this angle here, plus a shear deformation angle gamma. And dw dx minus gamma is this angle. And that is the angle beta. In fact, this is the rotation of this line of particles. In other words, we are not talking just about one state variable w as we do in the Hermitian formulation, but we talk about two state variables now, beta and w. Beta and w both are independent, and we will see that we later on will interpolate them as independent quantities. The important point then is that if we look at two elements, if we do interpolate w and beta independently, then we need between two elements continuity in w, and continuity in beta. We do not talk, talk about continuity in dw dx. We do not talk about that. And that is the important point, uh, particularly when we talk about the formulation of plate elements and shell elements. Uh, the fact that we talk about independent interpolations of w and beta, including shear effects, of course, in an approximate way, but including shear effects, that fact alleviates us of many difficulties that we encounter uh, otherwise. In other words, that we encounter if we use a classical plate theory excluding shear deformations. The, a good starting point for the development of the elements is the use of the total potential pi of an element. That total potential I've written down here. <laughs> And we have that pi is equal to a contribution from the bending part plus a contribution from the shearing part or the shearing deformations 
And of course, there is the external uh, work due to distributed pressure P on a beam element and moments, externally applied moments M onto the beam element. Now notice the quantities that I'm using here. The bending part is given by dw dx squared, of course, with the flexural rigidity in front. And this part here is uh, given only in terms of the section rotation beta, which is independent of the translation of the neutral axis, w. Here we have the shearing part, dw dx minus beta are the shear strains. And uh, they have been written down here once more. If we look at this equation, here we get dw dx minus beta is equal to gamma. Uh, the other quantities, of course, that are used in the derivation of this uh, pi uh, are the stress being equal to V over AS, V being the shear force on the section, AS is the shear area. Notice that we are assuming the shear strains through the thickness of the beam element to be constant. Uh, they are constant because of this equation here, basically. W, of course, varies along the length of the beam. Beta varies along the length of the beam, but that means gamma is constant through the thickness of the beam. Now, since gamma is constant through the thickness of the beam, we have to uh, say, of course, that also our shear stress is constant through the thickness of the beam. And we have to introduce a shear correction factor k, which is equal to As over A, where As is an equivalent shear area. Uh, well, using these quantities, we obtain this pi functional, uh, where, once again, we simply add the bending contribution, uh, bending strain energy to the shear strain energy, and we subtract the uh, total potential of the external uh, loads. If we invoke the stationarity of this functional, in other words, we invoke that del pi is equal to zero, we obtain the principle of virtual works of virtual work or principle of virtual displacements, which I have discussed with you in uh, an earlier lecture. Uh, the result of invoking that del pi is equal to zero or invoking the stationarity of pi is this equation here. Now notice that in this equation we have, if we want to interpret it once physically here, basically the real stress part, here the virtual strain part. Uh, similarly here, the real stress part and the virtual strain part and of course the virtual work of the external loads. Uh, the important point is that we only integrate along the length of the beam and not through the thickness anymore because we talk about quantities, uh, uh, stress resultants over the thickness. Well, once we have arrived at this equation, we can proceed in uh, uh, much the same way as we have been proceeding in the development of continuum isoparametric elements. Uh, here we look at a particular case. Let us say we have a beam element such as shown here. Of course, this is the loading applied, P. The bending moment that we're talking about here is shown here. It might is a distributed bending moment over any part of the beam. Similarly, P is only applied over a certain part of the beam. The depth of the beam is B. The width of the beam is A. As the shear factor for a rectangular beam, the shear factor K that I introduced to you briefly is 5 over 6. Of course, I, the moment of inertia, is AB cubed divided by 12. The interpolations that we would use for such a beam element are one-dimensional interpolations. We only integrate along the length x. And uh, the one-dimensional interpolations we discussed already earlier, we uh, simply use the same that we have been using already in the formulation of truss elements. Two-point interpolation would be uh, this element here. Here we use a three-point interpolation. Notice, and this is important, that we are talking about W and beta, the section rotations, as independent quantities. So for a three-point or three-nodal-point beam, we would have in 
just uh, a planar analysis, we would have 6 degrees of freedom. For a cubic element, we have 8 degrees of freedom. Uh, of course, for a Hermitian beam element, we would have only these degrees of freedom and those degrees of freedom, w and dw dx here and w dw dx here. So that is the reason why the Hermitian beam element is more effective. However, we can use these interpolations directly to develop curved beam elements, five elements, and uh, uh, then, of course, this approach is, even for beam elements, more effective, as I mentioned earlier. Well, let us then write down the basic interpolations that we're using. Here we have W being the sum of HI, WI, the HI we discussed earlier already. And these, of course, are the nodal point transverse displacements. These are the nodal point rotations of the sections, beta. In other words, I could have used here as a notation beta i, but I chose to use theta i. If we write these equations in matrix form, we directly obtain this relation here, where hw simply lists the hi, u lists the displacements and section rotations, and similar here, beta is given in terms of an h beta matrix. We take the differentiations of hw and h beta, and we get dw dx be equal to bw times u, d beta dx equals b uh, beta times u. Once we have the principle of virtual work established for the element that we are considering, and have chosen our interpolations, the approach of developing the stiffness matrices, the load vectors, is exactly the same as in the, continuum, uh, in the uh, development of continuum elements. Well, here I have written down the various quantities. U transposed lists, as I said earlier, the displacements at the nodal points and the rotations at the nodal points. The HW simply gives the interpolation functions, Q, of course, being equal to the number of nodal points we are using. And uh, here we have H beta. The BW is given right here. Notice our J inverse comes in there because we have to transform from R to X, X being the actual physical coordinate along the length. Similarly, B beta being given here, again, the J inverse there to transform from R to X coordinates. Once we have written down these, we can directly substitute into the principle of virtual work and we come up with the stiffness matrix given here and the load vector given here. Let me point out a few important things here. Of course, this B beta matrix here, just to remind you, comes from D beta dx. It's in fact really D beta dr, but we have, because we're integrating from minus 1 to plus 1, however, we have our determinant j there to take into account the volume transformation. Uh, here, of course, we have d beta dx transposed. Uh, that is the virtual. This comes from the virtual strains, and that comes from the real strains. Uh, of course, we have the stresses there, so these strains times the stress-strain law, E being the Young's modulus, gives us the stresses. Uh, here we talk about shearing deformations. Notice that we have here uh, the uh, w dx, that is the bw, minus the beta. So we have the derivative in here of w, but no derivative in h beta, because we are simply interpolating here the beta values. Again, of course, a transformation from r to uh, x, and therefore we have a determinant j in there. Uh, the load vector looks just the same way as in the development of continuum elements. This is the transverse loading applied, P. This is, of course, interpolating. This matrix interpolates the virtual transverse displacements. Here we have the loads, the, the mom moment loads, the real moment loads, and this interpolates here the section rotations, beta, along the length of the beam. Uh, of course, again, the volume transformation uh, from R to S. Uh, this is really a straightforward application of what we discussed earlier. 
There is one important point, however, now that I have to point out to you. If we consider the functional pi, as I mentioned earlier, there is a bending part here and there is a shearing part here. Uh, notice that in this development I have divided through by EI over 2 so that I introduce a value alpha there and that alpha is really GAK divided by EI. Now if we look at that alpha value and let's look at uh, the value for a rectangular section, we would see that on the, uh, the A value, of course, is A times B, and the EI value, uh, the, the I value gives us really an AB cubed, if this is here B, and that is A, an AB cubed over 12, of course, and we have also the uh, GK in front, that gives, gives us these, and of course an E in front here. But the important point that I want to now concentrate on is really this B over B cubed. Uh, we can see that as the element gets thinner and thinner, as the element gets thinner and thinner, that alpha gets larger and larger. As alpha gets larger and larger, this term here will be predominant. This term will be predominant. Now, this means, however, that if we want to finally converge to a beam in which the shear strains are negligible, in other words, in which the shear strains are extremely small, what we will have to be able to represent in the formulation is that this value here goes to zero. And what happens in the formulation really is that as this value gets larger and larger, any error introduced in the formulation due to the fact that this is not exactly zero in the finite element interpolation, that error is largely magnified, is magnified, and in fact we are introducing a, can introduce a very large error uh, if this value is not zero due to the fact that alpha becomes larger and larger if the element becomes uh, thinner and thinner. In other words, in summary once more, as we are talking about a beam element that gets thinner and thinner, for which we know the shear strains should become smaller and smaller, our finite element interpolation must be able to represent this fact. Now if we look at the shear strains, and this is of course here nothing else than basically the shear strain squared, we now identify that dw dx minus beta, when interpolated using our interpolation functions, must become, must be able to be very, very, very small. And that is the restriction on the formulation. Uh, so what we have to do really is use high enough order interpolations so that dw dx minus beta can be small for thin elements. Of course, for thick beam elements, that is not really a constraint because we know that the R shearing deformations and the shear deformations can be quite significant. However, for thin elements, we must be able to represent uh, the fact that gamma is small and therefore we have to use high order interpolations. In fact, the parabolic interpolation is really the uh, lowest interpolation that, that one can recommend. It would be better to use cubic interpolation. In fact, we use really cubic interpolation in practice. In that case, this gamma value can be small and uh, we uh, run in no difficulties, although the element, and the element can be very, very, very thin. Another approach would be to use the discrete Kirchhoff theory or reduced numerical integration. Uh, these approaches have been developed for low order elements. Uh, the discrete Kirchhoff theory approach is very effective. The reduced numerical integration can also be effective but has to be used with care. In particular, well, uh, I, as I will point out in the next lecture, we have to be careful that we do not introduce spurious rigid body modes into the system. Uh, the 
development that I just talked about uh, really is applicable to uh, an element that is, has a rectangular section. Uh, and the element was also lying in a plane. We looked at a straight element. Let us now see how we can generalize these concepts directly to the formulation of general curved beam elements. And uh, uh, for that purpose, I've shown here, I'm showing here a more general beam element that lies in a three-dimensional space. It's still rectangular. However, we could also have a circular section. In, st in, uh, in fact, when we look at a pipe element, we do talk about, we have, of course, a circular section. Um, well, in this particular beam element, notice I'm looking at node 1 here, node 2 there, and generally node 3 here and node 4 here, because we want to pick up the curvature of the element. Uh, I have this element lying in a three-dimensional space, x, y, z. Notice that that element has uh, local coordinates, r, s, t. These are the isoparametric coordinates, and psi, uh, eta, zeta. These are the actual continuous physical coordinates in the beam element. We define normals at uh, each nodal point. Uh, the normal in the t direction here is 0 vt1. The normal into the s direction is 0 vs1. And similarly, we have two normals at each nodal point. Notice that for this particular rectangular beam element, I have the thickness A1 here and B1 there, and A2 here, B2 there. These thicknesses can be different. Now, what I want to use are the same basic assumptions that we have familiarized ourselves already with when we looked at the special case of a straight beam element in planar deformations. I want to use those basic assumptions now in the development of this more general beam element. And I want to use a continuum approach. Well, what we're doing then is the following. We interpolate the coordinates x, y, and z along the beam element in terms of the nodal point coordinates of the, no of the nodes that lie on the neutral axis of the beam, plus the, uh, an effect that comes in due to the thickness of the beam. Now let us go and look in detail at the x interpolations. The L denotes 0 or 1, 0 being the initial configuration, 1 being the final configuration. So let's put simply a 0 in there, think in terms of a 0 there, and let's look at the initial configuration first. Well, here we have the initial x coordinates of the nodal points. And there are q of them. These are the one-dimensional interpolation functions. Just the same that we used for a truss element, for example. Here we have the t-axis. Uh, this is the t-axis into the direction of the normal into the t direction. In other words, this is the t-axis here. Notice that that t-axis here corresponds to this normal here. That s-axis here corresponds to this normal here. So here we have t over 2, and ak being the total thickness of the beam corresponding to that t direction, hk being the one-dimensional interpolation functions again, and these are the direction cosines of the normal in the t direction. Uh, here I should really say this is a direction cosine corresponding to the x-axis, corresponding to the x-axis. When we talk later about the y and z axis, then we use the y direction cosine and the z direction cosine. This part comes in because the beam basically has a thickness into the t direction. Now, we have also to introduce the s-direction part. 
And here we have S over 2, the thickness into the S direction, the one dimensional interpolation functions, and the direction cosine in the X direction of the normal in the S direction. Well, if we want to find, in other words, the coordinates of any point in the beam element, and let us look once more back at the beam element. If I want to find the coordinate of a point P lying in that beam element here, there's say point P, what I have to do is I have to identify the R, S, and T coordinates of that point P and then substitute these R, S, and T coordinates into this part here and I would get the corresponding X coordinate. I proceed similarly with the y and z coordinates. Notice, as I pointed out earlier, we are talking still about the thickness a k h k here, here, and here, but we're using the x direction cosines, the y direction cosines, and the z direction cosines here. And similarly, for the s direction, uh, we are using similar quantities. So this is the interpolation, this is the interpolation of the beam element and using these three formulae we can directly obtain, we can directly obtain the x, y and z coordinates in this system of axes of any point in the beam element. This is the uh, most important uh, fact, the uh, interpolation that I have listed here as a starting point of the development of the uh, uh, strain displacement matrices and displacement interpolation matrices. Now let us uh, identify that if these are the original coordinates for L being 0, then we can also apply, of course, after the deformation, the same interpolation and we put L equal to 1. If we subtract the x1 minus 0x, we should get the displacement u. Notice that the displacement u are in the directions of the x-axis. Well, this is exactly how we proceed. We use these interpolations for before deformation and after deformation. And we subtract these interpolations, as shown here, and directly obtain the u, v, and w displacements. Of course, as a function of r, s, and t. Notice that if I proceed this way, notice that if I proceed this way, I have used the basic assumption that plane sections remain plane during deformation. This was the assumption that I pointed out to you earlier. And we are using it in this general formulation just in the same way as in the special application that I showed you earlier. Well, having then, uh, just to refresh your memory, the u, v, and w in terms of r, s, and t, of course, via these uh, subtractions, we obtain directly these equations here. Notice that here we have now the nodal point displacements u, k, v, k, w, k, and we have the change in the direction cosines. These are the changes in the direction cosines. Well, these changes in the direction cosines we want to express in terms of nodal point rotations. And that is achieved as shown on this view graph. We achieve, we can express these changes in the direction cosines directly by taking the cross product of a vector of nodal point rotations and I've listed here this vector this is a nodal point rotation about the x, y and z axis at nodal point k. We're taking the cross product of this vector times the original normal times the original normal and we get then the change in the normal of course for the t direction and for the s direction. If we substitute this relation, this relation here, 
Of course, remember that these quantities are known. They are given. So the unknowns now are theta x, theta k, sorry. If we substitute from here into our relation here that I developed earlier, we directly obtain the displacements of any point P in the beam in terms of nodal point displacements and nodal point rotations because these quantities here now have been eliminated and have been expressed in terms of nodal point rotations. Well, now we have all the quantities that we need to develop our strain displacement matrix for the beam element. Remember, all we need are the coordinate interpolations, which I had uh, developed, have developed already, and the displacement interpolations. With those two quantities, we can immediately calculate via the procedures that I discussed with you earlier, the strain displacement transformation matrix. And here it is given. Notice that we are now talking about strains into the eta directions, in other words, the eta, psi, and zeta directions. These are the directions that I pointed out to you earlier, which are the physical coordinate directions along the beam. Let me show to you once more the picture. The R, S, and T coordinates are the isoparametric coordinates. The eta, psi, and zeta coordinates are the physical coordinates along the beam. In other words, for the one-dimensional beam that we looked at, this eta axis was, in fact, the x axis. Of course, our x, y, and z axis are now global Cartesian axes. Well, then, with that information, we can directly uh, calculate the uh, strain displacement matrix here. This is done effectively in a, uh, using numerical integration, as I will be discussing in the next lecture. The transformations that are necessary uh, are also all done on the uh, integration point level. Notice that the UK here lists the nodal point displacements and the nodal point rotations. And of course, we have to also remember one important fact that for the beam, we are talking about stresses into the eta, psi, and zeta directions, normal stresses, shear stresses here that are related via this stress-strain law to the normal strains and shear strains. Notice that there is, again, the shear correction factor k, which we want to also include in the formulation, because we have assumed, we have assumed constant shearing strains through the thickness of the beam, whereas we know that for a rectangular beam, for example, uh, we have parabolic shear strain distributions if the beam is uh, straight. Uh, I like to now go on with the development of plate elements. Here we are talking basically about the same approach. As I mentioned already once, the beam element that I'm talking about here, that I have been talking about, is really only an effective formulation when we talk about, when we want to develop a curved beam element. Uh, for pipe elements also, in the case of pipe, elements. I should uh, briefly mention that, of course, we have to introduce also an ovalization degree of freedom. That ovalization degree of freedom uh, uses, uh, interpolates basically the ovalization along the curved pipe. Uh, that is an additional degree of freedom that has to be introduced in the curved beam element formulation. So the beam element formulation is effective for curved beams, pipes. Uh, however, it does show the basic procedure that we are following also in the development of plate and shell elements. And here we have uh, a typical plate element, in other words, a flat shell. The U, V, and W displacements are now interpolated in this way. Notice U being the displacement into the X direction, V the displacement into the Y direction, W being the transverse displacement. And again, we are talking about section rotations. Beta x being the section rotation about the y-axis. That is the beta x uh, section rotation. Beta y is a section rotation about the x-axis. So that our v measuring z positive upwards, notice our v for a point here is negative, and that's why we have a negative sign there. 
Well, with that then given, we can immediately develop our strains uh, by using the strengths of material equations that tell us epsilon xx is del u del x, epsilon yy is del v del y, etc. And of course, we're getting also our shear strains. Having developed these strains, we also recognize that our stresses are given in terms of these formally, where we have now here the stress strain law for plane stress analysis because we are looking at the plate as an assemblage of uh, thin elements, plane stress elements lying on top of each other. The stress through the plate, of course, is zero. And this is therefore the plane stress uh, material law that we, are putting in that we have been putting in here. And the z times this vector here gives us the strains. Uh, the shearing stresses are given here. And our functional pi that I used also for the beam element already is given here. Notice that we now have to integrate through the thickness of the plate element. Here's our shear correction factor again, which is introduced just the same way as in the uh, beam element. Notice here we have the uh, work or the total potential of the external loads, I should say. Uh, it is convenient now to integrate through the thickness because we can integrate prior to interpolating uh, the quantities and that then yields this uh, value for pi where our CB part and CS part here, these two matrices, embody the fact that we have integrated through the thickness. Uh, so we have the following uh, definitions here. Kappa simply lists the, basically the uh, bending strains, or the, I should say the, bend, the rotations of the uh, sections. Of course, here we have the shearing strains. Gamma lists the shearing strains. Uh, Cb now is a function of h cubed, just like in classical plate theory, of course, we also have an h cubed entering into the formulation. And uh, this Cb matrix embodies the fact that we have integrated through the thickness. Here is our Cs. Of course, in the Cs, we also have the k part. Notice that. Again, we have an h cubed here and an h there. Therefore, to use our interpolation for plate and shell elements, we will have to use high enough interpolations to be able to represent the fact that the shear strains go to zero for thin plates if we want to use this formulation for thin plates and shells. Well, invoking now the fact that pi shall be stationary, we directly obtain this equation here. And this, of course, is nothing else than the principle of virtual displacement for the plate element. Notice that from this point onwards, we simply need to substitute only our interpolations. The interpolations that we are using are now interpolations for w, beta x, and beta y. And of course, we also interpolate x and y. Uh, the, these interpolations beta x and beta y are independent from the interpolations of w and that is the important point as I uh, mentioned in the development of the beam element. The fact that we are dealing here with three interpolations uh, of course means that at each nodal point we have three unknowns w's and section rotations. Let us now look very briefly at shell elements. The same concept that we use to develop the general beam element after having discussed the special beam element is also employed now in the development of what we might call a general shell element versus the special plate element that I just discussed uh, or the special shell element that I just discussed because a flat shell, a flat shell is of course nothing else than a plate if we also don't have membrane uh, uh, forces. Well, here we are, I'm showing a shell element, a nine-noded shell element, and uh, notice that in this case now we are talking about this normal only. In the beam we had two normals, 
uh, Vt and Vs. Now we only have one normal. Uh, at a nodal point, we are defining the membrane displacements Uk, Vk, Wk being a transverse displacement, and the rotations alpha k and beta k. These rotations are uh, defined about the axis V1k and V2k. Now notice that these two rotations, alpha k and beta k, will give us the change in Vn during deformations. And this is really how we use alpha k and beta k. We express the change in Vn in terms of alpha k and beta k. The procedure is the same as in the case of the beam element. First, we express our x, y, and z coordinates. And we are using here the original normal Vn, the x, y, and z coordinates, uh, x, y, and z direction cosines, excuse me. Uh, these are here the x, y, and z uh, coordinates of the nodal point k. We have our two-dimensional interpolation functions, hk, now here, because we talk about a two-dimensional surface, the mid-surface of the shell. Of course, at each nodal point, the shell can have a different thickness, and that is denoted by using a different uh, ak value at each nodal point. Applying this interpolation here to the initial configuration and the final configuration and subtracting 0, uh, x from 1x and similar for y and z, we directly obtain the displacements u, v, and w. Notice that the displacements now are involving the nodal point displacements and the change in the direction cosines of the normal, denoted here. These changes in the direction cosines of the normal can directly be expressed in terms of the rotations alpha k and beta k. Now notice here that once we have done this, of course here we involve now, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, v1 and v2 no, uh, directions, and these v1 and v2 directions are arbitrarily selected. In fact, they are, for our shell element here, selected as shown here. Uh, but once we have selected v1 and v2 at each nodal point, and they can vary from nodal point to nodal point, then we can use this relation to obtain directly the change in the normal or the change in the direction cosines of the normal uh, during deformations, when the deformations are alpha k and beta k. So with this equation then and the earlier equations that I've given to you, we can directly obtain the uh, uh, displacement interpolation matrix and the strain interpolation matrix. One important point that I should briefly mention is that of course, for the shell, we have zero stresses through the thickness. Uh, so we have, to use, we have to use this stress strain law here. Notice there are zeros in this row and column. And uh, uh, this is here the plane stress part for the bending, and that is the shear, uh, uh, shear part here. This is the stress strain law defined in a local convected coordinate system where we are talking about the stresses through the thickness being this direction here, and these other stresses are aligned with the coordinate system. We have to transform this one here to the global coordinate system in order to uh, be able to use it directly in our formulation. And that transformation is achieved by these transformation matrices. Now, this element has been effectively implemented in the ADENA computer program, and uh, we want to use it using high order interpolations, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the basic element that therefore is very useful, which can be used as a flat element, a curved element, uh, or a curved element, or uh, it can have curvature in both directions. Uh, also, this is the basic element that is being used. 
We can also collapse nodes and derive other elements. As I pointed out earlier, the low order elements shall only, should only be used in very uh, special cases. I would not recommend these elements, although they can be used in principle. The element that is really useful is this one and that one. Both, of course, can be used uh, as curved elements, as I pointed out. Another feature, and this is the final uh, view graph that I wanted to show in this lecture, is that we can use these elements also in transition regions. Namely, here we have the shell element now being flat uh, that I discussed. And we can directly couple this element into another element, uh, which we call a transition element, which has the shell degrees of freedom at these nodes, but translational degrees of freedom only here. In other words, the continuum uh, element degrees of freedom right here. Notice three degrees of freedom at this node, only translations, whereas here we would have five degrees of freedom, three translations, two rotations. Uh, similarly, here we have a curved shell going into a solid. And again, here we have a transition element. Here we show the five degrees of freedom at a shell node and the three degrees of freedom at a continuum uh, element node. This is an effective approach to be able to couple directly shell elements into solid elements. I uh, have not talked, of course, about the actual derivation of the matrices used in the formulation of the transition element. Uh, that is a little bit beyond of what I wanted to present in this lecture. But the basic concepts are those that we discussed already in the earlier lecture for continuum element and in this lecture for structural elements. Thank you very much for your attention.